Chapter 14. It was the paralyzed countess who spoke. She had managed to partly raise herself on her couch, and her face expressed positive terror. Her husband hurried to her side, and, with a curiously cynical smile on his lips, Romanez rose from the piano. Miss Charlotte, who had sat rigidly upright and silent for some time, hastened to attend upon her sister. But Lady Elton was singularly excited, and appeared to have gained a sudden access of unnatural vigor. Go away. I'm not ill, she said impatiently. I feel better, much better than I have done for months. The music does me good. And addressing her husband, she added, ask your friend to come here and sit by me. I want to talk to him. He has a magnificent voice, and I know that song he sang. I remember reading it in manuscript album long ago. I want to know where he found it. Romanos here advanced with his gentle tread and courteous bearing, and Lord Elton gave him a chair beside the invalid. You are working miracles on my wife, he said. I have not seen her so animated for years. And leaving the two to talk, he crossed over to where Lady Sybil, myself, and Miss Chesney were all seated in a group, chatting more or less unrestrainedly. I have just been expressing the hope that you and your daughter will pay me a visit at Willesmere, Lord Elton, I said. His brow contracted a little, but he forced a smile. We shall be delighted, he mumbled. When do you take possession? As soon as it is all feasible, I replied. I shall wait in town till the next levee is over, as both my friends and myself have arranged to be present. Ah, oh, uh, yes, or uh, that is always advisable, and is not half so much as troublesome business as a drawing room is for ladies. Soon, it's soon over and low bot bodices are not de rigueur. Ha, ha, ha. Who is your presenter? I named a distinguished personage, closely connected with the court, and the earl nodded. A very good man. You could not have better, he said complacently. And this book of yours, uh, when does it come out? Next week. We must get it. We must certainly get it, said Lord Elton, assuming interest. Oh, Sybil, you must put it down on your library list. She assented, though I thought a trifle indifferently. On the contrary, you must allow me to present it to you, I said. It will be a pleasure to me to which I hope you will not deny. You are very kind, she answered, lifting her beautiful eyes to mine as she spoke, but the librarian at Moody's is sure to send it. He knows I read everything, though I confess I never buy any books except those by Mavis Clare. Again that woman's name. I felt annoyed, but took care not to show my annoyance. I shall be jealous of Mavis Clare, I said playfully. Most men are, she replied quietly. You are indeed an enthusiastic partisan of hers, I exclaimed, somewhat surprised. Yes, I suppose I am. I like to see any member of my sex distinguish herself as nobly as she does. I have no genius of my own, and that is one of the reasons why I honor it so much in other women. I was about to make some suitable compliment by way of response to this remark, when we were all violently startled from our seats by a most horrible cry, a gasping scream such as might be wrung from some tortured animal. Aghast at the sound, we stood for a moment, inert, staring at Romanez, who came quickly towards us with an air of grave concern. I am afraid, he said softly, that the Countess is not so well. Perhaps you had better go to her. Another shriek interrupted his words, and transfixed with horror, we saw Lady Elton struggling in the throes of some sudden and terrific convulsion, her hands beating the air as if she were fighting with an unseen enemy. In one second her face underwent such hideous contortions as robbed it of all human semblance, and between the agonized pantings of her difficult breath, her half-choked voice could be heard uttering wild cries. Mercy! Mercy! Oh, God! God! Tell Sybil! Pray to God! Pray! And with that she fell heavily back, speechless and unconscious. All was instant confusion. Lady Sybil rushed to her mother's side. With Miss Charlotte, Diana Chesney hung back trembling and afraid. Lord Elton sprang to the bell and rang it furiously. Fetch the doctor, he cried to the startled servant. Late Elton has had another shock. She must take him to her room at once. Can I be of any service? I inquired, with a side glance at Romanas, who stood gravely apart a statuesque composed figure of silence. No, no, thanks all the same. And the Earl pressed my hand gratefully. She should not have come downstairs. It has been too exciting for her. Sybil, don't look at her, my dear. It will only unnerve you. Miss Chesney, pray go to your room. Charlotte can do all that is possible. 
As he spoke, two of the manservants came in to carry the insensible countess upstairs, and, as they slowly bore her on her coffin-like couch past me, one of them drew the coverlet across her face to conceal it, but not so quickly that I could not see the awful change impressed upon it, the indelible horror that was stamped on the drawn features, horror such as surely was never seen except in a painter's idea of some lost soul in torment. The eyes were rolled up and fixed in their sockets like balls of glass, and in them also was frozen the same frenzied, desperate look of fear. It was a dreadful face, so dreadful in its ghastly immovableness that I was, I was at once reminded of my hideous vision of the previous night and the pallid countenance of the three phantoms that had scared me in my sleep. Lady Elton's looks now resembled theirs. Sickened and appalled, I averted my eyes, and was glad to see Romana as taking farewell of his host, the while he the while he expressed his regret and sympathy with him in his domestic affliction. I, myself, approaching Lady Sybil, pressed her cold and trembling hand in mine, and respectfully kissed it. I'm deeply sorry, I murmured. I wish I could do anything to console you. She looked at me with dry, calm eyes. Thank you, but the doctors have always said that my mother would have another shock depriving her of speech. It is very sad. She will probably live for some years like that. I again expressed my sympathy. May I come and inquire about you all tomorrow? I asked. It will be very kind of you, she answered quietly. Shall I see you if I come? I asked. I said in a lower tone. If you wish it, certainly. Our eyes met, and I knew by instinct that she read my thoughts. I pressed her hand again. I was not repulsed. Then, bowing profoundly, I left her to make my adieu to Lord Elton and Miss Chesney, who seemed terribly upset and frightened. Miss Charlotte Fitzroy had left the room in attendance on her sister, and she did not return to bid us good night. Romanas lingered a moment behind me to say another word or two to the Earl, and when he joined me in the hall and threw on his opera coat, he was smiling to himself, somewhat singularly. An unpleasant end for Helena, Countess of Elton, he said, when we were in our brougham, driving away. Paral paralysis is perhaps the worst of all the physical punishments that can befall a rapid lady. Was she rapid? Well, perhaps rapid is too mild a term, but I can find no other, he answered. When she was young, she is barely fifty now, she did everything that she that could be done by women at her worst and wildest. She had scores of lovers, and I believe one of them cleared off her husband's turf debts, the Earl consenting gladly, on a rather pressing occasion. What disgraceful conduct, I exclaimed. He looked at me with an expression of cynical amusement. Think so? The upper ten quite condone that sort of thing on in their own set nowadays. It's all right. If a lady has lovers and her husband beams benevolence on the situation, what can be said? Nothing. How very tender your conscience is, Geoffrey. I sat silent, thinking. My companion lit a cigarette and offered me one. I took it, mechanically, without lighting it. I made a mistake this evening, he went on. I should not have sung that last love song. The fact is, the words were written by one of her ladyship's former admirers, a man who was something of a poet in his way, and she had an idea that she was the only person living who had ever seen the lines. She wanted to know if I knew the man who composed them, and I was able to say that I did, very intimately. I was just explaining how it was, and why I knew him so well, when the distressing attack of convulsions came on, and finished our conversation. She looked horrible, I said. The paralysis? the paralyzed Helen of modern Troy? Yes, her countenance at last was certainly not attractive. Beauty combined with wantonness frequently ends in drawn, twitch, fixed eyes, and helpless limbs of life and death. It is nature's revenge on the revenge on the outraged body. And, do you know, attorney's revenge on the impure soul is extremely similar. What do you know about it? I said, smiling in spite of myself, as I looked at his fine face, expressive of perfect health and splendid intellectuality. Your absurdities, your absurd fancy, fancies about the soul, are the only trace of folly I discover in you. Really? Well, I'm glad you have something of the fool in my. I have something of the fool in my disposition, foolishness being the only quality that makes wisdom possible. I confess I have very odd, very odd notions about the soul. I will excuse them, I said, laughing. God forgive me. In my own insensate, blind conceit, the while he ref he regarded me fixedly, in fact, I will excuse anything for the sake of your voice. I do not flatter you, Lucio. You sing like an angel. 
Don't use impossible comparisons, he replied. Have you ever heard an angel sing? Yes, I answered, smiling. I have, this very night. He turned deadly pale. A very open compliment, he said, forcing a laugh. And with, a, with almost rough haste, he suddenly let down the window of the carriage, though the night was bitterly cold. Though this vehicle is suff suffocating me. Let us have some air. See how the stars are shining like great crown jewels. Deities are regal regalia. Hard frost, like hard times, brings noble words into prominence. Yonder far off is a star that you can hardly perceive, red as cinder at times, and again blue as lightning. I can always discover it, though many cannot. It is Algol, judged by superstitious folk to be an evil star. I love it chiefly on account of its bad reputation. It is no doubt much maligned. It may be a cold quarter of hell where weeping spirits sit frozen in ice made of their own congealed tears. Or it may be a preparatory school for heaven. Who knows? Yonder, too, shines Venus, your star, Geoffrey, for you are in love, my friend. Come, confess it. Are you not? I am not sure, I answered slowly. The phrase, in love, scarcely describes my present feelings. You have dropped these, he said, suddenly picking up a fascinating knot of violets from the floor of the Braham and holding them towards me. He smiled as I uttered an exclamation of annoyance. They were Lady Sybil's flowers, which I had inadvertently let fall, and I saw that he knew it. I took them from his hand in silence. My dear fellow, do not try to hide your intentions from your best friend, he said seriously and kindly. You wish to marry the Earl of Elton's beautiful daughter, and you shall. Trust me, I will do everything I can to promote your desire. You will? I exclaimed with unconcealed delight, for I fully recognized the influence he had over Sybil's father. I will. I promise, he answered gravely. I assure you that such a marriage would be one after my own heart. I'll do all I can for you, and I have made many matches in my time. My heart beat high with triumph, and when we parted that night, I wrung his hand fervently and told him I was devoutly grateful to the fates for sending me such a good friend as he was. Grateful to? Whom did you say? he asked with a whimsical look. To the fates. Are you really? They are very ugly sisters, I believe. Perhaps they were your ghostly visitors of last night. God forbid, I ejaculated. Ah, God never forbids the fulfillment of his own laws, he answered. To do so, he would have to destroy himself. If he exists at all, I said carelessly. True, if. And with this, we separated to our different quarters in the Grand. End of chapter 14 of The Sorrows of Satan